Good afternoon. I'm Tom Ryden. I'm the executive director of Mass Robotics. So for those of you who don't know uh, our organization, we're an independent nonprofit that serves as an innovation hub for robotics, AI, and smart connected devices. Uh, we aim to bring together startups and existing technology organizations to nurture and promote economic growth and innovation. Our mission is to grow the robotics ecosystem and to support wide adoption of robotics. Uh, one of the ways we do this is with these industry-focused events like what we're hosting today. Um, this is one of what we call our signature series events, where we delve into industries that have challenges that can be solved with robotics technologies. And we offer a platform for innovation sharing amongst potential solution providers and those who could benefit from robotics adoption. This series also covers the logistics, defense, manufacturing, and construction industries. Today, we'll hear from food supply chain companies, learn about their challenges, and discover areas where adoption of robotics and AI can help. Then we'll hear from a group of select robotics startups um, in, the, in, sorry, in the robotics and AI uh, realm who can help with some of the solutions that they're providing. We've teamed today with uh, Tufts Food and Nutrition Innovation Institute. And I'm excited to have Katie Stebbins here, who has, uh, we've worked together in the past, so it's a lot of fun for me to have Katie join us today. And I'd like to ask her to say just a couple of uh, opening remarks uh, and tell us a little bit about what Tufts is doing. Fantastic, thanks Tom. I'm so grateful to get to partner with you, old friends at Mass Robotics in my new world at Tufts Food and Nutrition Innovation Institute. So food, especially as we're talking about the pandemic and um, just all sorts of things this past year, food is such an essential convening common denominator, right? And what we work on in tech and innovation really is about what are those groundwater connections, right? What are the little, what are the connections that we make underground that create the collisions, the innovation collisions, right? And when Tom and the folks at Mass Robotics approached me on this, I thought this was so great because this is one of those groundwater connections. You know, as we innovate food, as we make food more available to more people on the planet, as we make food more sustainable, healthier food available to more people on the planet, uh, we had a report that came out recently that showed that 63% of hospitalizations in COVID could have been prevented if people were not suffering from cardiovascular disease and obesity. We have a real food related crisis in this world and uh, any ways that we can intersect new ideas, new inventions thinking uh, with technology and automation or robotics being one of those, I think it's a win-win. So I'm really excited about what we, um, what we hear today, what we see today, and I hope this is just the beginning um, like anything, I like to begin the conversation, but I also invite the conversation to continue uh, as we keep going. So thank you so much, Tom. Great to be Great. with you. Thank Thanks, Katie. Um, so, uh, you know, as Katie mentioned, we've seen that the COVID pandemic has really brought an acceleration in robotics uh, and the adoption of robotics and the development of robotics in nearly all markets, uh, food technology being no exception. Um, and according to markets and markets, the agricultural robotics market is projected to grow from 4.6 billion in 2020 to 20.3 billion by 2025, um, which is a cager of 34.5%. You know, reducing the number of labor, the amount of labor and the growing population, the increasing requirements for high productivity from existing farm areas are factors fueling this growth. And we're excited today to be able to share some technologies that we think might be able to help. Um, but before we do that, we're going to actually hear from leaders in the industry about some of the challenges they have in their facilities. Um, before we get started, a few logistics. Uh, if you'd like to ask questions, there is a question tab um, on the bottom right on your screen. Uh, you'll see that. Just type it in. Uh, we have a packed agenda, so I'm not sure we're going to get to all the questions. Uh, if not, we'll make sure we funnel the questions to uh, the presenters that, uh, that you've indicated that might be able to, to answer them. Um, also, we're going to be showing uh, presentations and there's a number of slides and uh, videos. So we would encourage you to close off some of your other applications. We've seen that video sometimes show up behind another application if you're running multiple things on your screen. So uh, to get the best, we, uh, we encourage you to do that. So let me see. First up, uh, we have uh, Jeff Morrison. So uh, Jeff is, uh, I'm gonna read this because otherwise I will forget, has focused 
Jeff has focused on management, innovation, and technology in agriculture for over 20 years, 18 of which has been while he's been employed at Grimway Farms. His main areas of involvement include innovation, new technology, continuous improvement, and forecasting, along with a variety of experience managing field operations, including planting and harvesting. Projects include precision farming, robotics, imaging, UAS, GIS, database, mechanical design, AIML, and product development. Jeff, a lot on your plate. We're really excited to, to have you kick us off and tell us a little bit about Grimway Farms and the, th the work you're doing. Yeah, great. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Hey, I'm, I'm really excited to be here today and talk about these topics. Uh, my, my involvement in agriculture is driven by an excitement for producing food. It's, it's one of the cornerstones of society and especially organic, healthy food. And then also technology. Combining technology and agriculture is one of my favorite, my favorite endeavors. And uh, being exposed and participating with uh, mass robotics is, has really got me excited. So Great. I really am looking forward to sharing some information about what we do with our business, how technology can fit and where some of the headwinds are, which means there's some really great opportunity for robotics. So let's go to the next slide. Great, so I'll, I'll speak a little bit about our core business to give some people some information on what we do. We're a, we're a large grower of carrots and leafy greens. And when I say leafy greens, I'm referring to all the different uh, lettuce, the uh, uh, broccoli, cabbage, et cetera, cilantro, parsley. We grow about 55 different leafy green products. We're a large diversified grower across the United States. We're, we're the largest organic vegetable grower in the world now. And we're also the world's largest carrot grower. We don't grow just organic carrots. We also grow conventional carrots too to satisfy that market demand. On an annual production cycle, we're gonna grow on about 90,000 acres. Which is a which is a pretty it's a huge footprint for a vegetable operation, and all of our all of our production is domestic, so we do not produce outside the U.S. border. When you talk about the challenges that we're faced on a day to day basis, we're faced with labor scarcity. This was this really became front and center as COVID hit, as people couldn't come to work and and illness became an issue. It was a real problem. Uh, we have limited specialized technology. Uh, agriculture, especially our business, is really a kind of a legacy business in the sense that it doesn't it doesn't natively draw technology in. I think uh, some of the numbers that were shared at the beginning of this call illustrate that it's a it's a, it's a burgeoning area for robotics and automation. Then, when you look at our our operational footprint, we have limited suitable acres. I bring that up because that that may not necessarily be, uh, be impactful on the surface, but when you look at, at some of these slides and some of the video we'll see in a minute, you'll see that we operate at a production density that really can't be, it can't be uh, marginalized. So we have to stick with the production density, which is driven by a limited uh, availability of acres. And then when you look at the, uh, the, the harvest process for these leafy greens, it's a selection intensive process because we may come through a field more than one time. We may harvest, uh, have an initial pass through on harvest and then wait for some of that, that lettuce to size up again or to hit the quality standards that we have to deliver and then we'll do another harvest event. So it, that's where the, uh, the vision and the processing, that selective process for an automated system can become very, very important. When you look at the quality of the product, these are fragile products. So the robotics and the handling place extreme demands on, on whatever end effector or mechanism is going to interact with the product. And then when you look at the outside, the outdoors operating environment that we work in, it's, it is considered a harsh operating environment for robotics, sensitive systems, computers, uh, ruggedized enclosures are the, are the rule of the day, uh, moisture, uh, dirt intrusion, those are always problems. So we'll see some pictures and some slides of some, some systems that we're working with that I think will help illustrate what we, what we work through on a daily basis. Next slide. 
So if you look at our, our geography, so this gives you an idea of our scale. Our core region is here in California. So I'm in California today. We, we operate in California because we, we can satisfy our four seasons of production. Since we produce 52 weeks out of the year, we have to have our core operation in a region where we can produce every, every week of the year. But it doesn't mean that we don't have production in other areas out around the United States. So in the Pacific Northwest, we have a spring and a summer season. Out in Colorado, we have a summer season. And out in Florida, the Southeast, we have a fall and winter season. It helps plug gaps. It helps shorten the supply chain, the delivery to market. It makes us more efficient. Next slide. So I'll start out with lettuce production. Lettuce is a product that most people are familiar with. I'd be shocked if anyone on this call hasn't had a salad in the past week. But I would be surprised if most people understood and had seen where some of that lettuce had come from. So this is a, these pictures illustrate what a typical lettuce field looks like. You can see that it's, it's very wide open. We have the lettuce arrayed in an orderly pattern across what we would call a bed. So that, that form soil that we plant on, we refer to that as a bed. And then as we move through harvest, you can see on the, uh, on the left side of that, kind of that field perspective, we've already come through and harvested some of this lettuce. So you can see that it's been removed from the field. But take that detail slide on the upper right. That, that is kind of a, a limited perspective of what the camera would see as as it was working through a field. Next slide. So again, another perspective on lettuce. These are just typical field conditions. You have an orderly array of lettuce. We have tracks in between the plants that we use to drive tractors in and out of the field so that we can fertilize, harvest, etc. In a sense, that's how you would access these products with any sort of mechanized system. You can also see some of the gaps. Oh, yeah, we'll go to this. No, there's no need to go back. Uh, so, okay. So, you can see there. Okay. So we're on the uh, we're on the video now. So this this video is going to show what a typical lettuce harvest scenario looks like. You can see it's a very labor intensive process. Lots of people, they're performing a, a cut. So they're selecting product out of the field. And then at the same time, they're performing a, a, a trim and groom function. So they're, they're going to cut away or trim away some of, those, some of those desiccated leaves or some of those leaves that aren't necessarily part of the product that would be delivered to the consumer. So this, this process that you see here, this is an industry standard process. This is very typical. This isn't just a, a Grimway operation. This is what you would see in all growing regions as people harvest lettuce. And this harvest process happens, uh, it happens 52 weeks out of the year. It does not end. Okay, it looks like the video ended so we can go to the next slide. So when you talk about other, other types of production environments too, we looked at some lettuce, but there are also other products that are, that are great candidates for automation or, or new robotics technology. Take lettuce, that lettuce ex example in the previous slides, those are a fairly straightforward model for access and selection in the sense that you have a product that you're, you're looking at, you're observing, you're making a selection out in the open, but then this pepper production, it represents a much higher threshold for, for success. Now we have, you can see there are a lot of obstacles in the field. There are stakes that hold up the strings that support the plants. And then the product is obscured by leaves. So this is another, another labor intensive harvest process that happens every week and is a great candidate for automation, although a much more complex operating environment. And this field is one of our partner 
farms that we work with. We collaborate and try to help solve problems across operations, even if it isn't part of our native, our native farm. Next slide. So when you look at technology, so what technology do we have access to? So radish, radish harvest. This is a harvest machine that we have on our farm. This is equipment that we sourced from Europe. And the way I would characterize this type of system is this is a system where there's zero selection. So it's an automated, it's an automated harvest system, but there's no selection taking place. And it automates some of the functions like banding that employees currently perform. Can you uh, go ahead and start the video? So as we look at technology, technology fit across our farm, this radish machine represents a non-selection type process. So there's no, there's no vision or imaging. We're taking everything out of the field and we're really relying on maybe some legacy technology. So we've got some pneumatics, we've got, we have the, uh, the uh, computers that are synchronizing the functions on the machine, and then some pretty creative mechanical design to handle those, those radishes. This is a type of technology that we have access to now, but it doesn't necessarily solve the problem on those prior scenarios I discussed, like lettuce or peppers. I hope you enjoy this video on this machine. Most people that see this video really find it fascinating. Okay, looks like the video is wrapping up. So that's a really quick run through of what we do, a few common harvest scenarios, what the field configuration looks like, the type of technology we have access to now. When we look at when we look at the challenges, the business challenges, the headwinds we're faced with. I think Joy unmuted. Joyce and I we had a great discussion yesterday, and it and our viewpoint is is that as as labor scarcity drives up the cost of production, we want to make sure that we maintain access to these products. We want to make sure that we can sell into the marketplace and provide a, a greater range of products at a price point that ensures access to fresh, healthy, organic produce. We the last thing that we want to happen is to have cost of production uh, limit, limit these products access in the marketplace. Great, Jeff, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate that. I, I, a couple of questions around use, but that really gets into kind of, I think, details. Um, so I'm going to move on from that. Um, I think people are asking, can, can you operate 24 seven? Can you, you know, if you put in a robotics, so currently there's no way a robot could keep up with what that human lettuce, the person picking the lettuce can do because they do so many tasks, but right. can the robot do it maybe 24 hours a day? Can it operate at night? All sorts of questions like that. And I think those are fantastic questions as you really get into these challenges. Um, and so, we're looking forward to folks to continue the conversation with Jeff and others as you really start to think of these solutions. So I'd like to move on. Uh, next up is we have Larry Jacobs, uh, co-founder at Jacobs Farm Del Cabo and Dale Dickerson, Director of Organizational Development. So Larry's been a pioneer in organic food production, uh, proving that we can grow profitably food without chemicals. Um, after his own dangerous encounter with uh, pesticides, Larry dedicated his life's work to organic farming. From co-founding the California-based Jacobs Farm, uh, the nation's largest producer of fresh culinary organic herbs, to building Del Cabo Collaborative, a 1,300 farm, uh, family farm strong partnership uh, supporting organic farming in Baja, Mexico. Larry has created a strong legacy of social and environmental responsibility in farming. So we're, we're great, to, great to have you, Larry. Dale, great to see you guys again. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to you and your presentation. Thanks.
right. I cannot hear Dale. See, there we go. There we go. There we go. Now we're all set. <laughs> thank you, Tom, and thank you for giving us an opportunity to uh, to participate with Mass Robotics. We're really excited about where this, the potential for where this might go. Uh, as Tom described, we started uh, back in the prehistoric times around 1980 with my wife Sandra Boleyn uh, growing a wide variety of vegetable crops, and in that focused this on, because of a shortage of water at the time, on growing fresh culinary herbs. At around 1985, uh, as a, uh, on the rebound from doing some work in Central America, we started a, working with a group of small scale Muted. to the tip of the Baja. Originally, we began that as a, uh, a, a program to just increase people's standards of living and incomes. That grew into a business. Today we're in over 44 different communities. You want to switch to the next slide there, Tom? We're in about over 44 different communities, uh, well over a thousand families, and up and down the Baja Peninsula and in a, in a few communities on mainland Mexico. In California, which is where we're going to focus the presentation today, we farm 400 acres in California in several different locations. We have packing and distribution out of Los Angeles and San Francisco. Uh, and, and we really focus the California operation on, on fresh culinary herbs, adding that flavor to, to the meal that you, uh, in a way that really sparkles. Next slide. So how do we go from the field to the, the pack house? I, oh, I'm, you know what, I'm not seeing the slide there came up. Okay. Oh, okay. So okay. just a, an overview of what the field looks like and what the harvesting looks like. It's the, the fresh culinary herbs is a very labor intensive process at the harvesting side. Uh, we're harvesting into uh, a plastic totes with a, with a plastic liner manually. By and large, we, we've recently begun some, uh, uh, some mechanized cutting of the products. You can see the, I don't know if the video is going in the far right corner, top right corner. Uh, so there's a split between hand harvesting these herbs and uh, a, uh, a small mechanized cutter. The herbs go into a, a 10 pound box uh, and that's a, a, a uniform size. And then they're all moved uh, on pallets by trucks. Next slide. I want to note how much happier those guys are with a machine than the ones. Yeah, the, <laughs> the guys really like the machine. Just to segue a little bit, this uh, convergence of computing power in the what what Moore's law had predicted in the uh, uh, the change in video technology and camera technology, along with you know a, an aging workforce in the agricultural field, uh, a lot of our we don't have any young guys anymore. They're all 30, 40, 50s. Uh, and this is hard work. And the cost of living going up, it really mandates we need to find ways to provide our field team members better incomes. We, we want their kids to have the same opportunities everyone else's kids have. We want them to have to be able to pay and have good medical care you know, and have choices. Uh, we want them to be able to enjoy life, and that need, means some economic freedoms and abilities, and that means being able to pay them more. And just the cost of living, especially in the Bay Area, has gone up so quickly. We really struggled with, you know, how do we get more money into these guys' pockets? Uh, and when when the markets aren't changing that much, so we're really looking towards what the potential is for automation. 
to be able to drive some changes in what we're doing and to be able to bring better incomes to our to the to the, the people that make up our company. Dale, you want to pick it pick it up from here? Well, here we show in the in the pack house and the warehouse. There's two, we have two uh, locations, LA and South San Francisco. Uh, you can see the floor in the middle picture there. That's kind of the overall setup of the floor there. On on the left, we have someone who's packing sage, and you can see this is a very manual process. You've got to sort through each individual item, get rid of some bad pieces. Put in the clamshell and currently we are using clamshells as one of our packs uh, plastic we would very very much like to get away from that and that's we're looking at ways to do that but right now we're in these plastic clamshells um, hoping to move on from that then we see some uh, basil packing in the middle and weighing the clamshells and that's about it for this slide. Let's move on to the next slide. Here's an example of the uh, labeling process that's going on, uh, label application for all the clamshells. And next slide, I think. Packing the, the finished clamshells into the totes and the uh, shipping containers. These are the orders being prepped to go out. Next slide. We'll run this video. This gives you a little bit of more of a picture of what goes on in the warehouse. Here we have Jesus. He's, uh, he's making bunches. These are typically 12 counts to a bag. So this is also a very manual process. These folks get incredibly good at this, but still, it's pick each each group, handle each piece individually each time. Put the tie wrap on there. Here we're doing experiment. Again, this is bunches, not in a clamshell, but an individual bunch that goes into a bag and then goes to a, a goes to the distributor. Now we're having a closer look at the label application process. These totes on the floor, they're building these clamshells. They're putting them in these totes. The totes are carried over to where we're doing this label application. There's a, a step right there that's a manual process. It could probably be aided by some, some automation. We're going through the label application line. And then you're going to see it as we move on to uh, clamshells coming off the line. We've got four people here sorting, adjusting, arranging clamshells. And as we talk through this and look, this is one area we talk about low hanging fruit that, uh, for automation. Certainly, this is one spot where that could take place fairly easily. adjusting the clamshells, getting them ordered, putting them in a box. More label application. We have, we have several different types of herbs, so this line has to change many times during the day. Different labels. We have our label. We have private label. Um, so lots of iterations during the pack day and this line needs to change with each each time that comes up. Packing clams into the uh, target box. They're highly efficient. They really know how to do this, but they've been with us a long time. A lot of these folks are getting a little bit older. (laughs) 
different sets of packs. They're putting rubber bands on these little groups, putting them in the box. Again, this is one good example where you, we really feel like some automation could help. Next slide. So summary. And I can't read this very well. Why mechanize first? Can you see this, Larry? I can't, I'm having trouble reading this. Talk about old people here. Yeah. <laughs> so the first and foremost, this mechanization, we're seeing it as an opportunity to improve the well-being for our labor force. Uh, I think this is a critical thing. We need people to be working in this field. We need the field. We need the uh, income levels to be higher. And yet there's constraints on, on how much you can sell these products for. And so that really dials into how do you make these jobs more efficient? Uh, the, the other aspect of it, these are hard, boring jobs, and it's got to be that we can figure out how to take the boringness out of this work and make it a lot more interesting, or at least not as mundane and more sustainable. Uh, there's an aging workforce in the act field. There's less and less people who want to do it. Uh, so there's inherent difficulties in in just getting more labor today. Uh, so so this is it's it's worked in the automobile industry, it's worked in the warehouse industry. It's it's time for the ag industry, and there's just enormous opportunities here. The we were focused a little bit more in this presentation on what we're doing indoors. There is innate issues with, with outside because of the weather conditions. We've gotten pretty good on the harvesting side and we're seeing ways of, of mechanizing the harvest. But we're, as we're bringing them all into a central location, the challenges we have are with sorting. There needs to be some cleanup. Uh, getting these, these little twigs and branches into a, con a finite container so that they fit nicely and look nicely for the consumer. Uh, and the, the late moving that product and getting into the running it through the labeling machine and then grouping the the pack. And the future pack is, is likely to be a some kind of a paper paper pack, but right now the clamshells will be similar. Grouping those clamshells and then and then putting them into an individual containers or packing them in the box. Those felt like some of the low hanging fruit for us and the, some easy opportunities to mechanize the system and improve the life in the workspace for that group of uh, team members. Dale, anticipated application challenges. You wanna take that one? Well, we're a heavy, heavy reliance on, on sorting and packaging like we've seen, and uh, the, the herbs are delicate, as uh, Jeff mentioned in the previous, so it's not easy to handle. I mean, if we could come up with something in the pack house that could sort herbs and put them in a target pundit, that would be great, but it's a difficult challenge to do. Um, it's not one homogenous type of herbs, it's several. Uh, and they tend to kind of stick together, so that's a, that's a tough challenge. How you do that's a tough challenge, but uh, it would be great to see it happen. Uh, yeah, multiple herbs, varieties. So it's a very heterogeneous pack. But the, Unmuted. Just like there's some low hanging fruit here in our packing line process that we'd be excited to collaborate with to help solve. Uh, so the, this industry has gone from hand harvesting we're moving more to some machine harvesting processes and where we began and where we're hoping to go for we we're hope we're keeping an open mind and really interested in trying and innovation and new things last slide so just to give you guys an idea where we started <laughs> 
Thank you. Thank you very 19... much for uh, putting up yeah. with our 1982. Putting up with us here. Great. Well, let me hop back on here. So thanks, uh, thanks, Larry. Thanks, Dale. Really appreciate uh, the presentation. We had a couple of questions, which I'm going to uh, get to real quickly. Um, one, it just, it, but I want to just make a comment. If you have such a variety of challenges um, in your facility that it just amazes me, um, you know, everything as you talk about from, we didn't even talk about what's happening in the field, uh, but in the pack out, everything from sorting to, I think somebody, and somebody asked this about weighing, that you made a comment of, um, so how do people know how much to package? Do they weigh everyone or do some of them just have a sense for how much sage is what you need and, and do that without weighing? Because um, it looked like one was weighing and one was not. Um, can you touch a little bit about that and, and how, you know, is that an important part is, is getting the right amount of, of, uh, of material uh, into these clamshells? It is important to get the right weight in the clamshell. Um, we do spot, they do check on weighing them at, at times. However, most of these folks have been doing this for so long they've got a real good idea what uh, what it takes to to get that clamshell filled in at the right way yeah and it looks like there's a, a a kind of a unique way of folding them to get them in the clamshell and another challenge of is you know, because it looks different right it's there's no conformity or, or consistency um to the way that that seems to go into each clamshell is is that correct it will be depend on the variability coming out of the field into the pack house because you know those the sage may be longer one day or shorter the next day so one day you might have to fold it the next maybe not um so it's ever changing yeah and then also just how many different herbs do you actually pick and pack and do they change on a daily basis or are you picking like one set of herbs for a week and then switch to another one how does that work Daily, the same uh, array of different herbs. What, Larry? What are we? With? Six, seven herbs that we're packing at, at any given day. More like ten to ten or ten to twelve. Uh, it's the it's the um, Simon Garfunkel song: uh, thyme, sage, rosemary, uh, all, all the ones you, you you everything from Thanksgiving to Christmas. And, uh, and this is more of a question for me, but not from the audience, but um, I imagine, and, and you touched upon this really briefly, but uh, the cost of each of these containers is not very expensive. If I go to the, my grocery store, I know what I'm paying for them. So the investment you can make in a automation system, there's gotta be a strong ROI to be able to balance that, right? Um, it, it is that, how do you make that choice of what, what to invest in and how much investment do you put into automation? It's a calculation on the ROI. Uh, if you ask our, our, our CEO and CFO, CFO, he's going to tell you, I want to see an ROI in a couple of years. Uh, that may not be feasible. It, it may need a, a longer ROI. But there's just no question because of the nature of these jobs, the, the redundancy of them, uh, the mechanizing, mechanizing this process is, it's, it's a necessity and it's inevitable. Okay. And one last question about, um, you had mentioned, or I guess I read in, in, that there's a, you, you manage 1300 farms or there's 1300 farms in the cooperative. Um, so that's not 1300 individual farmers who would buy any equipment. If you developed equipment, you would share that amongst the 1300. Is that is that right? Well, on the herb side, the packing is happening only in two places. It's Got happening it. in Los Angeles. San Francisco. Uh, so that packing equipment would just be in those two places. There's another aspect, another side of, of what Jacobs Farm Del Cabo does, and that's the whole Del Cabo line of cherry tomatoes, and peppers, warm weather crops that, that follows the sun from the tip of the Baja up to the San Diego Tijuana border, and then back down in the wintertime. And that's a, a different issue of, of seeing color on a plant. It's similar to what uh, uh, what Cal Organics was talking about with their peppers. Yeah. Uh, and and it is interesting that on the in the on the Mexico side of the border, they're also having labor shortages as their society 
progresses in time. It's harder and harder for them to find uh, staff and helpers to to pick the crop and to deal the manual things. Uh, and, but that's an outside process, uh, and that would that's going to need to be mechanized too. It's 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 maybe a little bit further down the line, uh, but there's a big need there, and that's a, a lot of farms and a lot of volume. Great. Well, thank you guys very much for sharing. Um, and uh, it's fascinating. I know I've seen some of this before. I still get fascinated um, just to see what you guys are doing and, and understand that um, it's a growing challenge. As Grimway Farms mentioned, as you guys mentioned, uh, right, labor is getting tougher. There's more of a demand. And, and so I think it's just a, it's a huge market that robotics can hopefully address. So uh, switching gears a little bit here, but still on the food supply side, uh, chain side, is Marty Lynn. Uh, who recently joined Tyson as the director of the new Tyson Manufacturing Automation Center, uh, which is located in Springdale, Arkansas. Marty has been responsible for helping start up the operations of the uh, Tyson Manufacturing Automation Center. Uh, it's a state-of-the-art facility that was designed to help Tyson develop and implement automation, robotics, and advanced technology for their production plants. Prior to joining Tyson, Marty worked as, as a principal engineer for the robotics and manager of the advanced automation group at General Motors. So a little bit of a switch there from, from, uh, from, from cars to meat, so to speak. But uh, Marty worked for General Motors for 34 years and was involved in a variety of manufacturing projects and was responsible for the global robotics business at GM. Um, and I want to just point out GM is a great partner of Mass Robotics. Uh, so we, we appreciate them for, for supporting us and our efforts. Um, so next up is Marty. Marty, take it away. Thanks, Tom. I, I recognized uh, as I was watching Larry uh, in the previous uh, talk that I'm continuing the tradition of an old guy wearing glasses and a beard uh, talking on this uh, webinar. So appreciate very much the opportunity to talk to everybody. Um, the, uh, I, who was that Simon and Garfunkel? Anyways, never mind. I'll go ahead with the talk. Um, maybe the next slide, please. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to all of you guys. Uh, as Tom said, I am uh, new to Tyson Foods. I, uh, I'm the director of the Tyson Manufacturing Automation Center, and, and I consider myself now a two-year veteran of the food industry. Uh, my disclaimer on that is that I've uh, been eating food all my life. I like food. Uh, probably to excess uh, <laughs> too often, um, but uh, uh, it, it's really interesting because, and I'll get into this a little bit later, but uh, the, the pressures and challenges of looking at automation uh, were really recognized by Tyson uh, several years ago. And, uh, you know, the, it, again, Tyson is, as an agricultural uh, food protein company, has been uh, looking at ways to improve efficiency and automation is uh, certainly foremost and um, uh, really key in front of us to uh, improve going forward. So uh, they set up this uh, Tyson Manufacturing Automation Center and, and uh, asked me to come down and, and be a part of uh, what's going on using the experience that I've had uh, in my previous automotive background uh, to try to apply those same uh, same procedures and processes into trying to uh, add automation to the food industry. So uh, next slide, uh, let me talk a little bit about the, the Tyson background. And, um, you know, that Tyson was established in, in 1935, uh, back in the early 30s, a uh, man by the name of uh, John W. Tyson uh, founded the uh, company who was, he moved from uh, Kansas to uh, Arkansas to try to uh, get and make a better life for his family, looking for opportunities to feed his family. And uh, he, he started hauling, uh, hauling vegetables and fruits around uh, and delivering them. And uh, one of the things that he ended up starting to do was to uh, uh, haul chickens from uh, the Midwest here up into Chicago. So um, it, it really had markets in Chicago, Kansas City, and St. Louis. And that really was kind of the the, the basis for the uh, Tyson Food Company as going through uh, the poultry industry and developing the poultry industry. 
so we like to say that it was really born of necessity and opportunity and uh, and really grown through innovation and core values. Tyson is is really um, strong in terms of keeping the the humility and the um, I, the family values of working hard and trying to solve problems and and really taking care of their team members every, each and every day and trying to get a little bit better each and every day. Uh, so next slide. Today, of course, we're a, a modern, diverse uh, food company. Um, I was quite shocked my first day here uh, to realize that Tyson sold a lot more than just chicken. Uh, in terms of prepared foods and beef and pork. Uh, it's just a, it's a worldwide global company that has uh, approximately 139,000 uh, team members. Um, and again, there, there's just a very, very diverse modern food company that uh, is selling products uh, to customers all over the world. Um, and next slide. These are some of the brands, and, and we are very protein-centric, um, but uh, these are just some of the brands I wanted to just, uh, I, I won't go through each and every one of these, but um, it's not sometimes readily apparent that it's uh, the same Tyson company that uh, is selling all these different brands, but again, our, uh, we're really uh, uh, centric and have a substantial portfolio across beef, chicken, pork, and prepared foods. Uh, next slide. These are some of the uh, U.S. operations, and you see that we really span from coast to coast. There are, um, um, uh, you know, headquarters, corporate offices in Chicago and Dakota Dunes, and then uh, I'm talking to you today from the um, Springdale, Arkansas, at the uh, Tyson Manufacturing Automation Center. Uh, that's where our uh, our headquarters are located. And uh, we have different types of plants doing different, uh, different products, uh, again, all across the country. Uh, next slide. And I just wanted to uh, briefly show our international operations. Tyson really is a global company having operations across the, the globe. Next slide. So this is the uh, Tyson Manufacturing Automation Center. Uh, it's kind of our uh, glamour shot picture from the outside. Uh, interestingly, this was an old truck shop where we used to do repair and maintenance of uh, trucks. There's, you see kind of the big open windows. Those were truck bays where they would pull in uh, after hauling loads uh, around the country. And if they needed service on their trucks, uh, they would get it at the, uh, uh, the truck center here. Um, and what we did is, is after um, there was a recognition that we wanted to do more and more automation, uh, the, the idea and the strategy was really, well, let's have a pl place that we can try out new automation, we can collaborate with technology providers, and we can actually test and validate that technology prior to deploying it into our plants for a particular application. All the applications, for the most part, are fairly unique to us. Um, we, 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 you know, they're new in terms of uniqueness. Uh, they're not unique just to Tyson, but they're unique uh, in, in that they're new. And, and for the most part, we hadn't done those types of things before. And we also recognize that uh, to be successful doing automation, you really have to have a focus on the team members and being able to train those team members so that they can use the technology and the, the systems that we're, we're deploying in the, in the production plant. So um, really probably a third, a uh, quarter to a third of the uh, TMAC center is dedicated to being able to train team members and really coach them up uh, to be able to do their jobs and use the technology correctly. Uh, so there's a, a short video that shows kind of the, the older pictures of the, of the truck shop and then how it's transformed into the insides of the uh, Manufacturing Automation Center. So please roll the video.
Tyson's always been a company that's been out on the forefront of innovation. This is a beautiful facility that we can really inspire that next generation of team members to really get involved in automation and robotics. Our intention here is to train people for that next revolution of automation, which allows them to upgrade their role in our company. We can uh, bring together the, the top talent around innovation and, and automation and robotics to try and create some really uh, outstanding solutions for our uh, operations. This facility is about training, it's also about collaborating, it's also about innovating so that when that equipment hits the plant floor, it's ready to operate and our team members know how to operate. This is really a facility dedicated for our entire company. Anyone can come here, collaborate uh, with the operations team, the technical team to create those solutions that are really going to make a difference for our company. Thank you. So as I got ready to make this talk to this group, uh, you know, I started thinking about uh, some of the, what are really, what are the keys for automation success for, for Tyson? Um, and, and the other uh, panelists have touched on some of these things. We, we really are focused on applications that are um, really fit into what, what I would refer to as the three Ds. You know, it's, it's dull, it's difficult, it's, it's a little bit dirty. Um, you know, those are the types of applications that if you go and you try to automate those things, it really makes the work a better working environment for the team members. It you know has the potential to improve your quality, to improve your efficiency, and and um, and and really make it safer overall, safer for the workforce. I mean, those are the real key items for us as we look at applications. You know, how do we improve the worker and product safety? How do we improve that quality, and how do we improve the efficiency? Obviously, you have to have an ROI on that. You have to be able to, to uh, calculate how the, the equipment and the, justifying the equipment expenditures and, and understand how that's going to uh, really impact your bottom line. For a company like Tyson, a, a large protein food manufacturing company, we have to be able to automate processes at scale. Um, you know, we have a number of different uh, plants and operations, or there's variability in all of our products. There's a variability in the incoming products. There's ver variability in the products that we manufacture and then send out to our consumers. And 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 we have to be able to um, encompass that variability and still maintain the efficiencies, the the qualities and yields. Um, and we have to do that at scale. Uh, it really is important for us to be able to identify and control those process quality drivers and automate in a way that we know that we're going to ensure the overall product uh, the overall product quality so uh, one of the things that uh, is also important for a enterprise that's as as large as tyson is having common controls architecture and a digitization strategy what are you doing with all that data how do you collect it how do you use that to be able to enhance and, and augment the product safety, the, the worker safety, and, and really understand those, those drivers and how you're controlling those drivers. And then the bigger thing is how do we, you know, we, we need to ensure that we're deploying proven and validated technologies. Those technologies that we are, are certain are going to work, we're not going to impact our production by trying out a scientific experiment on the plant floor. All of that is really almost counterintuitive to how do you do new things. So it, there, there's a fine line balance. And, and again, that's where the Manufacturing Automation Center fits is being able to, um, being able to, 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 to kind of fit between new ideas and new innovative solutions 
validate those, test them out. You saw in the video uh, what we call our production environment lab. The production environment lab allows us to test the equipment in the same type of environment that it will the equipment will see in our production plants. And, and that's really key to uh, ensuring the robustness, the robustness of the solution and the robustness of the equipment as we uh, deploy solutions going forward. Okay, so next slide. This just talks about the, the kind of what we call the governance of automation, really all the different elements across the enterprise that uh, we use to drive the strategies, this automation strategy through what I'll refer to as our engineering factory. So, you, you know, how do we produce these solutions? You have purchasing, and of course, they're looking at the dollars and cents. They're trying to get the, the best bang for the buck. If they're going to buy a machine, is it the best machine? Is it the most cost-effective machine? There's, there's ways of dealing with all the different suppliers in, in terms of developing strategic relationships and having commercial specifications. One of the key items for us in an enterprise this wide is making sure our commercial specifications are understood and clearly articulated to the suppliers. Safety, of course, is our highest priority item. We need to make sure that we're deploying equipment and solutions that are safe are going to be safe for our team members to operate and is going to ensure the safety of the, the products that we're we're sending to our uh, customers um, and then have uniform guidance of those of those safety guidelines across the enterprise. We have an automation group and that automation group is then going and, and they're trying to make sure that they're deploying the same solutions across the enterprise and reduce those variations, making sure that from application to application we're consistent. And that that consistency then allows us to collect the digital data and be able to control the processes and understand the business drivers in a very uniform way. The, um, and the automation group also is maintaining the standards and the, the technical specifications for procurement. We have the TMAC, and again, that is a kind of a leg of this stool, if you will, uh, the five-legged stool that uh, we, we're helping to provide the guidance and strategy on those solutions. And then we also are leading uh, to do validation of those technical solutions to ensure that our process requirements are, are adhered to, that we're conforming to all those requirements. We have the information technology group, which the TMAC is a part of, and, and the, the IT group really allows us to collect that data and use that data in a way that's gonna, gonna streamline the overall process of producing the, the high quality products that we do and also allow us to understand the insights of the, the quality and safety drivers of the systems that are producing that, uh, those products. Okay, ne next slide. So one of the things that Tyson did uh, several uh, several years ago in 2016 is they formed a Tyson Ventures group. And I thought it would be interesting to put the contact information. Raul Ray is the director of the finance, is under the finance group. He's a director of this uh, Tyson Ventures. And what uh, they look to do is to partner up with emerging technologies and, um, and, and really innovative game-changing technologies and people that have unique solutions. And then from that, we would work to find a way into the overall value stream of Tyson operations and being able to figure out how to deploy that, those solutions, develop those into robust solutions and then be able to deploy them into the Tyson plants. Okay. I appreciate uh, everybody's attention today. Thank you very much. And uh, Tom, I'll turn it back over to you. Unmuted. Hey, Marty, thank you very much. I, a couple of questions that, that uh, I want to get to, um, and then we're going to take a break. So I don't want to eat into too much time in the break time. We do want to give people a couple of minutes to stretch their legs before we start the second half. But um, so one of the questions was, uh, you know, the pandemic certainly has stressed the supply chain. Um, did you find any new opportunities that uh, anything that has come out of 
of the recent challenges with the pandemic? Well, as I said, the, we really identified the needs to be able to automate or the needs to automate um, quite a bit before the pandemic. You know, the, the labor shortage that was discussed by the other panelists is a real thing. The aging workforce is, is a real thing. <laughs> yeah, look. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I hate, I'm looking at myself on top of the screen here. Uh, you know, the, the, the reasons for doing automation are just as valid today as they were a couple of years ago when, when Tyson started on this journey to really look at uh, more standardizing the process to do automation. The pandemic certainly emphasized the need to be able to, to, to have safe solutions for our team members, trying to, to find ways to keep from impacting the, the supply chain to our customers of food. And, and it, you, you have, you know, we still are going to be a very, very manual centric um, uh, production facilities. I mean, we're, we're, it's not like that's going to go away. We're going to be able to have automation that really is tools that will help our team members be better and more efficient. And, um, you know, the pandemic probably emphasized the fact of the the fragility of the overall supply chain. I don't know if anybody else had had shortages in grocery stores, but all of that was due to the fact that there was interruptions at the factories, at the plants, it really throughout the at the farms throughout the supply chain. And and you know, using automation to try to streamline that process and kind of uh, fill the gaps, so to speak, uh, is really going to help that going forward. Okay, and uh, another question just um, around, um, I think you talked about digitati digitization. Are you interested in tracking all the way from the field or the, the farm, so to speak, uh, that food all the way through the, the entire process? Is that something that's, uh, that you guys are driving towards? We certainly would like to be able to do that. Um, as you can imagine, it's the amount of data is just almost overwhelming. But But I think that as we get better and better, you know, there's no shortage uh, to the need and uses of digital information. If we can capture it and, and be able to, to understand how that really impacts the overall flow of food from farm to table, uh, it's really going to help us. Great. All right. I'm going to. Yep. It's all right. <laughs> Give us up 10 minutes. So we're going to take a break now until 315. Thank you, Marty, very much for sharing. Thank you, the other panelists. Um, so the second half, we're going to switch it up a bit. So we've got almost a dozen startups that are going to give really kind of these quick uh, five minute pitches uh, around what they're doing and how it could potentially impact uh, in the food technology. Uh, so, as I said, we're going to we're going to take a break from now until 315. So just about 10 minutes uh, and we'll uh, rejoin then and we'll get right into some of this. Uh, we're going to start it off by a, uh, a, a presentation by. Uh, American Robotics on kind of industry 4.0 and what does that mean for agriculture? So, uh, and then pitches by these companies. So looking forward to that. We'll see you in about 10 minutes. Thanks folks. Welcome back. Um, so uh, first again, uh, thanks for the, the panelists who joined us in the first half um, and great to get some insight into some of the farms and what they're doing and some of the challenges they have. Uh, and now we're going to start the second half with um, hearing from VJ, uh, who is the CTO of American Robotics. And I will say that American Robotics was one of the first startups that joined, in fact, the very first startup um, that joined uh, Mass Robotics when we opened our doors about five years ago, which uh, is amazing that it went so quickly. It seems like just yesterday. Um, so VJ is going to talk about uh, essentially uh, agricultural 4.0. So I'm interested to hear about that and then also hear about the latest from, from your company. So VJ, take it away. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, very glad to be able to join this panel. And uh, you know, when I first started talking with uh, Joyce about this panel and our pitch in this panel, um, I also mentioned that I wanted to uh, get on my soapbox uh, and talk a little bit about agriculture 4.0 which i look at as a, as a parallel to the industry 4.0 concept so this is you know 
uh, my thoughts and uh, some my thoughts uh, about uh, what I consider agriculture 4.0 and uh, how we as uh, roboticists and artificial intelligence uh, experts and so on can contribute to agriculture and that's just uh, uh, in, and how it parallels industry 4.0. So, uh, Josh, can we go to the next slide, please? So, just uh, you know, a quick uh, uh, look at the food production chain. It is a long and complex one. Essentially, you know, you you have uh, plants and uh, from the fields which uh, grow your grains and crops and other things, and then you have the ranches and the aquaculture from that. You know, from the water, you all the food source from wherever it is, the field or the boats or the uh, ranches, they need to get to the consumers, uh, us as consumers, because every human needs to eat to survive. Uh, and the path from the production all the way to the consumption can be long and complex. And of course, there are means to short circuit that, uh, but uh, are they, how scalable are they? That's a good, that's a question. And we don't uh, know whether that can be answered in the short term. Um, and uh, necessarily this chain, this food production chain is serial because it had the food has to be first produced before it can be processed and distributed and then consumed by the end, end uh, consumers. And this uh, uh, chain is also very time sensitive because food is perishable. Uh, there are some ways to preserve food such that we can make it last longer but at the end of the day it is perishable and uh, and hence is time sensitive the getting the food from the from the production point to the consumer can be uh, also quite complex because there are there is a lot of interaction between regulations and different technologies and different behaviors even from or whether it's on the consumer end or on the producer end um, there's a lot of complex interplay that happens and all of these cause can cause delays or can, can speed up or can make things more efficient or inefficient, right, depending upon the interplay. So next slide, Joyce. So um, what does all of this mean in terms in terms of the agriculture and food trends that uh, we are going to we are seeing now and we will see in the future? Um, so there was this very nice report that was put out by the World Government Summit in 2018, and they broadly categorized uh, uh, all. Mo they categorized most of these issues into four categories. You know, basically you have the demographics which are changing across the world. You have a higher popula population growth, which will mean there is a higher demand for food. You'll need we'll need about 70 percent more food that uh, that has to be produced by 2050 and urbanization across the world is going to change uh, consumption patterns uh, you're going people are going to be eating more meat and processed food as urbanization increases uh, over the next 10 years or so then you have um, climate change which also affects uh, agriculture and food production you have greenhouse gas emissions which uh, which are increasing because of in increased industrialization and so on and because of all of these climate change issues, you're, we are going to see a lot of uh, changes in crop yields as well. And, and you know, this is general, the, I, I use the term crop yields. It's not just uh, land-based crops. It's also anim, it's also animal products and aquaculture and so on. All of these are going to vary because of climate change issues. Um, you know, the, there are floods and drought which affect uh, things happening on the land, which which will course uh, uh, have an impact on crop yields. Then the third big macro trend is um, how natural resources are used or misused or how would you want to look at it. Basically, you know, already 25% of all farmland uh, is considered to be highly degraded just because of uh, some of the uh, farming patterns that uh, have been used across the world. Um, and there's also deforestation, which which is primarily driven by agriculture concerns, which then feeds into climate change and so on. So it's, you know, all of these are interrelated issues. And the last macro trend, of course, is food waste. Um, you know, between the developed countries and the developing countries, 
there is a lot of food waste. On the developed country side, perhaps about 30 to 30 percent of the food that is produced is 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 going to waste. And on the de on the developing country side, it that percentage could be as high as 50 percent. And uh, so it's not just the food that's wasted, but also the fresh water that goes into pr into producing this food that also gets wasted, right? And in in uh, growing all of this food, there's also greenhouse gases that are generated. And I found this particular fact uh, quite interesting. If this food waste, if all of this food waste were considered a country, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases after China and USA, which I, I just thought was, to me, was quite mind blowing. Uh, next slide. So what do these macro trends mean? If you look at all of these macro trends, um, essentially what they're pointing to is that it is going to increase scarcity of food and hunger in the in the next few years uh, unless we develop uh, new and innovative solutions. And not just develop, we also need to deploy them, get them into the hands of, get them into the entire food uh, production chain. Right. So yeah, and that's why we are here. Uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, uh, ex uh, excellent uh, startups here as part of this part of the event here who are who are who have come up with a lot of these uh, new and innovative solutions and will be I'm excited to hear about them. Next slide, Joyce. So um, industry 4.0. This is you know a term that was coined by the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab in the 25 in the 2015 2016 timeframe. Essentially. Uh, you have automation and increased uh, improved communication and connectivity and uh, big data and artificial intelligence. You throw all of these into the mix and essentially, you know, you can use all of these technologies to digitize the entire value chain, whether it is in the vertical direction or horizontal uh, uh, direction, all these different uh, value chains. And then once you once they are digitized to a, to a good extent, then you can digitalize the products and the services, right? And then and then of course, based on that, you can get to the business models and the customer access part of it. So, can we apply some of these concepts to uh, agriculture? And uh, are they being applied? And to what extent are they being applied? And these are you know I found these these questions to be quite interesting uh, when we try to apply these concepts of industry 4.0 to the agriculture world and food production world and see where, where we fall. Um, so next slide, Joyce. So uh, thankfully, uh, McKinsey put out an excellent report also related to this. This is a little bit dated now, this, this dates back to about 2015, where they looked at all a lot of different industries and the amount of digitization, not even digitalization, that uh, has that goes that is happening in all of these different sectors. Uh, agriculture and food, it is the oldest industry. It is the most impactful industry, of course, because every one of us has to eat to survive. Yet, it is the least digitized industry, whether you're looking at the labor side of uh, agriculture or whether it's the assets that in agriculture and so on. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, you know, American Robotics, we are a drone, uh, we, are, we are a company that uses drones to collect data uh, for agricultural purposes. And, uh, you know, we want, we want to know where our drones have to fly. And for that, we need to know the extent of the fields that a farmer or company owns. And uh, it turns out it is very difficult to get that information. Not all farmers know I mean, they know the extent of their fields, but that is not available in a digital format. Not always. Uh, you know, companies like Monsanto and Climate Corp and all these big chemical and input providers have tried to, and of course, agriculture finance have tried to digitize even land records just so that we have, just, the, just so they, they have access to uh, things about, you know, like GIS systems about that that uh, that give them information about uh, you know a farmer's fields and so on and of course we were able to leverage that to be able to uh, feed into our drone systems but uh, overall that the agriculture is one of the least digitized industry uh, and that is even 
it, that's just the digitization of the assets and the usage and the labor. It's not even the digitalization or, or even you know getting into the processes uh, that involve all of these different aspects. So next slide. So what does this mean? What this means is that every part of the food production chain needs help. There's a whole world of opportunity that I think uh, uh, is available for everybody who has a good idea uh, that can be used. So everything, you know, I talked a little bit about the digitization of land uh, and pharma uh, and farm operation. Basically, uh, how do farmers, you know, know who know where to send out their tractors or harvesters or combines or any of that? Well, a lot of that is just tribal knowledge right now and manual operations. There, there, there is very little digitization of that. Once we once we are able to get past get to a certain amount of digitization associated with that, we can get to creating digital twins of farms and ranches and so on. So, you know, there's a whole world of opportunity associated with all of these things that I have listed on the screen here. You know, we can get it uh, optimizations of coal, coal, the coal chain and the storage chain, which then we can feed into predictive processing capacity as uh, based on, you know, weather patterns or what's happening in the, in the production, on the production end of the, uh, of the food chain. And then uh, traceability of inputs and yields, because we want to know what go, what's going into our food and what's uh, what is happening, what are the different things that are going into the food, not just in the field end of things, but also as it's going through the processing and the distribution end of things. Uh, and on the food product and the food, I guess, the preparation and delivery end of things also, there's a lot of things that are exciting and are already in place, right? Things like ghost stores and restaurants are already in place where uh, the, the, go the ghost restaurant can, I guess, essentially change the cuisine of food that they're preparing without anybody knowing as because, uh, and pure, because they, they don't really have a storefront, so a physical storefront, so to speak. Uh, and can cater to the local uh, demand from the customer, from the consumers. So next slide, Joyce. So um, you know, just a, a chart here showing all of these different opportunities. Of course, drone and drones and robotics is uh, something that a lot of activity is happening today. Genetic modification, Internet of Things, all of these things can play into uh, how providing the help required at all at different aspects uh, at different locations or different parts of the food production chain so there's a lot of opportunity and i think if we have all the if we if you're able to come up with some good solutions i think they will be agriculture industry agriculture and food industry will be will take up uh, these ideas very uh, quickly and easily so that's my soapbox associated with uh, agriculture 4.0, uh, my thoughts there. Uh, and I will turn it back to you, Tom. Unmuted. Great, BJ. thank you. Um, and uh, obviously a ton of different technologies. We have a, a couple of companies that are gonna touch on some of this. Um, I'm not sure we have anybody who's touching on 3D printed food. That, that's kind of interesting. Um, but I think all of this, this technology is fascinating um, and you know, just being part of it is, is great. So um, why don't you real quickly touch upon what American Robotics is doing? Thank you very much for that, by the way. And I want to give you a chance to just talk about what you guys are doing uh, a little bit. If you could keep that real short, we're, we're already running behind, but that's not a surprise. <laughs> All right, thank you, Tom. Yeah, um, take a few minutes here to talk about uh, you know what we do at American Robotics with our drone system. Um, so let's see. Uh, Joyce, do you have the slide up for the for my pitch there? The next slide, Joyce. Let's see. Ah, there we go. All right, so yeah, uh, like Tom mentioned, I'm the co-founder and CTO for American Robotics. We were the first uh, company at uh, uh, Mass Robotics. We, even before they actually formally opened, we were uh, in that space. And so proud to be, uh, proud to have graduated from that space into our own space and uh, uh, be back to present uh, our technology here in this pitch. Next slide. 
So we make the Amer we make the Scout drone system. Uh, this is a drone in a box solution where the drone and the box, uh, the base station that we, as we call it, is deployed in the field permanently. And uh, the we we are now the first company to have been approved by the FAA to deploy these systems in the field with no humans required to operate them at all uh, in the field. Uh, of course, you know, for regulatory reasons, we, uh, the FAA does require a pilot to be operating these just operating quote unquote uh, uh, these systems, and uh, we as a company operate these systems from our uh, from our headquarters in Marlboro, Massachusetts. Next slide. This is a photograph of uh, our system deployed in a cranberry farmer's uh, uh, field in southern Massachusetts. I, and I put this photograph up here because I'll show you some uh, data that we have collected in this particular, uh, in our work with this particular organization. Next slide. So, uh, like I mentioned, you know, our operation, uh, our technology and our operation has been, has now been approved for these completely unattended operation. And I put, uh, so this is just a schematic view of uh, how we can operate. You know, if we have a system, uh, one of our scout systems deployed in Kansas, there doesn't, it doesn't require a human to be present locally there in Kansas for the system to be operated and collecting data. Instead, we staff a pilot, uh, quote unquote, like I mentioned earlier, in, in, the, in the Boston area, uh, who then operates the uh, operates or oversees the system operation wherever it might be. So this technology can be used to collect data on uh, agricultural fields uh, anywhere in the world. We can we can operate our systems anywhere in the world from uh, our headquarters in Marlboro. Next slide. So when, uh, I put up this uh, chart earlier, the world of opportunity in the food production chain. Of course, you know we would like to address all of these opportunities. But as a company, we have to start our focus somewhere. And we look, we started. So the scout system is uh, focuses on the first three bullet points there, the digitization of the land and the farm operations, and being able to use the data that we collect to create the digital twins of these farms and then use that, use the information, use the information we collect uh, using that digital and the digital twin to be able to do precision growing. Uh, uh, so that's how we work with all our customers. And I will show you some of the data in, uh, that uh, we've collected in our work with one of our partners here in Massachusetts in the next slide. So um, this is a cranberry growing operation in Southern Massachusetts, in Wareham, Southern Mass in Wareham Massachusetts. And you know, they have a lot, the, this particular grower has a lot of uh, uh, fields, they're called cranberry bogs, that are spread about, spread out over uh, you know, hundreds of acres there. And we, use, we have deployed one of our systems there that flies on a regular basis. Last year, we were flying essentially on a weekly basis over all of these cranberry bogs to collect data. Um, and you know that's something that the customer never had access to data about their, about their cranberry bogs on such a regular basis. Uh, it's just an overview of the field here, showing you know the different bogs and the different and the health of the plants in the different uh, uh, bogs. Next slide. So, having a completely automated system allows us to capture data at by flying the drone at various altitudes at very at uh, different resolutions. So, we at the field at the farm level we can capture data at uh, uh, you know lower resolutions and then. For particular, for individual bogs, we can fly at a lower altitude and collect data at a much higher resolution. So this is uh, showing this showing you an image of an individual bog uh, and uh, the the issues that uh, and I guess the variation in the issues within that bog itself. Next slide. Now, we so. We collect all of this data over a period of time, and that allows us to build this digital twin of this entire cranberry bog ecosystem. And uh, you know, given that we can fly very our very the altitudes at which our drone and uh, flies, we can collect some very very high resolution imaging. On the left side here, you you see 
early season blooms that uh, occur in the cranberries. And so, and then, you know, that, that allows us to do the feature tracking as soon as the blooms appear. And then we do some image processing and some <clears throat> computer vision analysis to be able to predict, to do some analysis, uh, not only to uh, count the blooms, but then use that information to be able to predict what the yields might be. Uh, and then, of course, later in the season, we are not only able to confirm those yields by counting the blooms, but uh, by counting the berries themselves just before harvest, but we are also able to provide information associated uh, information to the customer about when each particular bog might be ready for harvesting and so on, which is which is a capability that they that they uh, never had and wanted to uh, wanted very badly. Uh, and of course, you know this is an example that in in cranberries, but the exact same technology can be applied in strawberries or other uh, fruits like that, or even in row crops. We have done a lot of work in the Midwest in the corn and the soy uh, world as well. So uh, I think that's uh, that's all I have uh, for, about our technology. So I will turn it back to you, Tom. Great, thank you, Vijay, and uh, always great to see you and and uh, and fascinated to see the work that you're doing. And uh, again, also thank you for the overview. So uh, next up is Daniel Theobald and Daniel is with the CEO uh, of uh, Twisted Fields, the founder of Twisted Fields. Um, also Daniel, Daniel's very involved in the robotics uh, community and uh, was one of the uh, kind of the inspirers of mass robotics and, and was one of the co-founders. So uh, we're excited to have Daniel here and talk about Twisted Fields, Daniel. I don't see Daniel. Oh, there we go. <laughs> All right. Hey everybody. Great to be here. Excited to uh, participate in this great event. Um, just going to introduce briefly Twisted Fields and Acorn. Um, Acorn is a precision farming rover that we have developed and we've released as uh, open source. Next slide. So this really came out of um, uh, many, many years of research where uh, you know, we took into account uh, the, the trends, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because I think it's already been covered adequately, but um, a lot of problems in, in agriculture that um, really could benefit from uh, better use of, of automation. However, what we saw is that automation um, is expensive to develop and tends to focus on a few large problems and is not necessarily well positioned to meet the needs of the broadest number of farmers, uh, you know, small and medium sized farms around the world. Next slide. Next slide. So the idea was, could we provide an open source platform that would be easily adaptable to a wide range of uh, uh, farming chores and, um, and crop types and uh, farms and make it something that is super easy so that anyone with modest skills would be able to implement, adopt, modify, improve, uh, build upon this platform. Um, so what you're seeing right now is one of the early prototypes of uh, Acorn. Uh, it is completely built out of low cost, um, easy to find parts. And uh, we've put many, many kilometers on this vehicle, testing it um, at our research farm in Twisted Fields in beautiful San Gregorio, California. Um, and, and really subjecting it to all the worst that uh, a farm can throw at it. You know, some of the things that uh, were talked about earlier, dust and dirt and grime and water and, and inclement weather, um, and, and really work to make sure that the overall design is robust. Next slide. Our goal was not to um, necessarily provide one, uh, one solution to farmers um, or to developers. What we wanted to do was provide a base platform that gave people a, an opportunity to then focus on the things that matter uh, to their specific application. So much like you know, a cell phone, you know, think about if, a, a, um, if an app developer had to build the cell phone hardware and, and the cellular network and, and uh, the GPS network and all of these things from scratch, every time they wanted to build an app, we'd never get anywhere. So our approach was to provide all of the basic stuff 
that is needed to automate uh, a particular application. So the system has all the, all the localization, navigation, obstacle avoidance, safety certification, power management, communications and telepresence built in. A lot of times people are asking, well, what, what does the platform do? And the short answer is, it is now a platform that is available for building any wide range of applications, probably most of which uh, we have not even thought of yet, but uh, next slide. Uh, you know, it can certainly address um, a, uh, a whole range of different things. So um, one of the interesting aspects about it, and I guess the what it does is the last, uh, the last set of words. So you can go ahead and bring that up, Joyce. But um, one of the interesting, I don't know what that is. One, one of the interesting things about this platform is through the research that we've done over the years, um, what we've learned is that there's a tremendous amount of energy efficiency and, and weight capacity that is generally wasted in, um, in things like batteries or obviously internal combustion engines, uh, et cetera. And we had a hypothesis, what if, we, what if we got rid of all of that? What if we basically went straight from solar panels to motors or as close as that is, is possible? And what we found was pretty amazing that we were able to build an incredibly lightweight platform at an incredibly low cost. Batteries are expensive, uh, uh, solar controllers are expensive, they're heavy, they, they wear out. Um, and uh, um, we were able to get significantly higher energy efficiency um, without going through all of those energy conversion uh, um, stages. So, um, you know, everything from inspection to uh, seeding and weeding and, and uh, all of these precision farming activities uh, can be implemented on this platform. Next slide. So our goal is to start to build some of these uh, applications ourselves. We'll probably start out uh, with um, a number of um, a very simple seeding type of applications in addition to the crop, uh, you know, the, the close range crop inspection or, or what we would call data set gathering. Um, and then, you know, our overall strategy was make it open source, get it out there so that anyone can use it. Uh, you know, a big company can take this technology, download all the plans and add to it. Um, or, you know, a, a small farm, you know, in Africa um, would, would be able to uh, potentially take advantage of it as well. Um, uh, a lot of the parts are 3D printed or, or um, you know, uh, laser cut and, and uh, you know, simple welding processes and that type of thing. The goal is to make it so that you can source parts anywhere, you can repair it anywhere with basic skills. Next slide. So um, just a brief, to wrap it up, a brief summary on Twisted Fields. Uh, Twisted Fields is a, um, a research farm in San Gregorio, California, absolutely beautiful near the coast, uh, not too far from Palo Alto, San Francisco, Half Moon Bay, Santa Cruz. And um, our, our mission is to help use technology to make, um, uh, to make sustainable farming practices also practical and able to scale to meet modern agriculture needs. Uh, next slide. That's it. Um, please feel free to uh, follow up with me. We'd love to um, support anyone who is interested in building uh, applications on ACORN um, or building uh, um, implements for it. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Daniel. Appreciate that. Um, and I love the picture of the goats. <laughs> um, and it, the farm looks gorgeous. So glad to hear the progress that you're making on that platform. So up next is uh, Tarek Greenan from, from Nexus Robotics. Uh, he's the CEO of Nexus and, uh, and he's a company I'm not that familiar with, so I'm looking forward to learning more. Tarek, you're up. Hello, can everyone hear me now? Yep. Uh, I'm Tarek Greenan, CEO of Nexus Robotics and you can skip the next slide. We uh, set out to solve two major problems in agriculture, and that's labor costs and availability, which were a problem before the pandemic. And obviously, the pandemic has made uh, this situation even worse. And then also herbicide resistance, which is becoming worse and worse on many farms year after year. Next slide. 
this is a short little video uh, that we made. Uh, so you can just play that. Oh, is there no audio for it? Okay, well, I'll just I'll just speak. Uh, <laughs> just if there's no audio, just uh, skip over it. Uh, and then just play this as a video. So we set out to build a weeding robot. And the idea for this robot is to be able to actually pull weeds out of the ground. And the advantage of creating an autonomous solution such as this is that we're able to remove weeds that are very close to the crop without actually damaging the crop. So many weeding solutions that currently exist, uh, such as cultivators, are able to weed uh, the pathways in between the crop rows uh, quite well, but they're not able to remove the weeds that are within the crop row itself. And so with uh, this robotic technology, we're actually able to identify where the weed is emerging out of the soil. And then we use a gripper to go and pull the weed out of the ground. And what this allows is that uh, this is kind of a full solution that replaces uh, the need for herbicide as well as replaces the need to have workers come through and remove the weeds that the herbicide can't kill. And you can just skip, uh, skip to the next one. So that, uh, what you saw right there was uh, the version two of our prototype that we tested this past summer in Canada. And this is our design for our version three prototype that we are currently in the process of building. And the idea for this prototype is to take uh, the successes that we had with version two, where we were able to remove approximately 95% of the weeds. And now we just want to make it a lot faster uh, so that we can cover more acres for the farmers. And uh, as long as we can do this and show that it's economical, that's our main goal with our, our version three. You can skip to the next slide. And the vision for the future is to develop uh, a holistic solution for farmers and really give farmers uh, much more control of their farm than they've had previously. And so right now we're mainly focusing on weeding, but uh, in the future we plan on implementing two new branches of technology, one being uh, data collection and analysis. So things like insect pests and disease detection uh, yield estimations and moisture mapping in the field. And then another branch will be harvesting. So we want to target uh, crops that are still harvested by hand. So things like peppers, peas, beans, all of those things uh, could be harvested with a robot. And so uh, once we have uh, our weeding technology solidified within the market, we, we plan on using it for weeding as well. And that's the end of the presentation. I have my contact info on this slide here. So if you have any questions or uh, want to reach out, uh, please feel free to contact me. Great. Thank you very much, Tarek. Um, and I should point out, by the way, I, I failed to do this earlier, um, there's a handout uh, that has the uh, contact information for everybody who's presenting. Um, it is on the right-hand side. If you look at the little dashboard, you'll see a thing that's a handout and there's a PDF attached. So thank you again, Tarek. And we'll move on to Harvest Automation. Uh, so Charlie Grinnell is the CEO of Harvest Automation and uh, he's up next. All right, we have a slide. We don't have Charlie. Ah, there he is. <laughs> Charlie, how's it, how's it going? It's been a while. Uh, wait a minute, I don't have audio from him. All right. There we go. There we go. Now we're all set. Great. <laughs> hi, hi, Tom. Uh, so I'm going to tell you, uh, uh, I'm Charlie Grinnell from Harvest Automation. 
Uh, we specialize in mobile robots for material handling in agriculture and other uh, areas. But I'm going to talk today about our products for the nursery and greenhouse industry and a little bit about uh, what we're working on now, what's next. Great. Next slide. So this is uh, an indoor greenhouse grower, uh, one of our customers in Ohio. And essentially the best way to describe this is the nursery and greenhouse industry produces plants in containers. Uh, they're non-food crops, so things like flowers and shrubs and trees. And they come to the production uh, uh, point in their production where they're brought to an area grouped together like you see here in this image and then they need to be spaced out and allowed the room to grow efficiently uh, so our, our robots uh, uh, essentially focus on that task next slide so that's that was a greenhouse grower this is our nursery growers outdoors so very very large uh, production facilities this one is a uh, uh, satellite image of over a mile across. So this particular grower has over 10 million plants on the ground. All of them need to be moved around. And that is what we focused on automating. Uh, next slide. So this is how those plants are moved around now, is with armies of workers. So this industry has to hire uh, over 50,000 seasonal workers just to move plants around. It's, a, it's astonishing the amount of labor that they require. Uh, it's a big problem like for other uh, ag sectors and that's what we focused on automating. Uh, next slide, please. This is uh, one of our customers in Georgia and these plants, they weren't brought to this production area just recently, but they, they, uh, they wintered over here and were covered over, but it's the same job the, the customer needs to send out a small army of workers to take these plants that are tight together and space them out so that they can grow productively and they can sell them. Um, that yellow tape is part of our system. It, uh, we localize off of that. And this is over the course of a few hours here. Uh, we're moving thousands and thousands of plants. There are tens of thousands of plants that need to be moved in this area. And uh, this is what we do. So we've been we've been selling these products into the industry for uh, since 2015. We uh, most of our customers are in the U.S., but we also sell into Canada. And now we have a distributor in Australia, so we're selling robots in Australia, and Holland, and Germany, and Switzerland, and our most recent customer in France. Uh, next slide, please. So that's it. Oh. So that's it. That's it for our existing products. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the other things that we've focused on. So over time, this is just a sampling of many people come to us and ask, uh, can we help solve their problems in different areas? So growing vegetables in uh, containers or the poultry industry or the tea, har tea harvesting in Sri Lanka. We were working with a group last year. Uh, next, please. But the real challenges here, so most often what we find is the technology is feasible, but we cannot develop and produce a, commercialize a product that's competitive versus the cost of labor. So that's one of the big challenges. The other is that all of these solutions that we pursue are really focused, for instance, a robot that's going to help uh, in strawberries is not the same robot for grapes and not the same robot for oranges. So the market size is quite small and you can't justify the development uh, of new technologies. Now that said, we are focused on two areas. Next, please. please. Two areas that we're excited about. One is uh, indoor material, ha having an indoor material shuttle. And we've been um, contacted by a number of small manufacturers. So moving small amounts of material point to point uh, like a virtual conveyor. And you can see a, a list of different uh, areas that we've looked at. Next, please. And one that we're working currently is with an industrial gas supplier who wants us to move those 
uh, oxygen cylinders from point to point in their facility. And instead of following the yellow line like we do in the nursery and greenhouse, we navigate using a map. So that's one area that we're focused on. Um, next, please. The other solution that we're very excited about is a uh, uh, shuttle to help with harvest, outdoor harvest. So this is a scenario, this happens to be table grapes, but there's lots of different crops where you have people picking in the rows and the material, the, the produce has to be carried to the end to the pack station or way station. So every once in a while, one or all of the workers have to stop picking and carry their material down the row. Next. So in a robotic solution, you can have 100% of the time that the harvesters are out there focused on the picking. And we went uh, to the Central Valley in 2000, starting in 2017, and did a lot of research and discussions with table grape growers there. And we estimated at the time we could probably save them 15% uh, increased productivity by 15%, but uh, next please. Subsequently, a study was done in 2019 that demonstrated for table grapes that using this scenario, you could increase the worker uh, team by 25%, which is a significant. And so imagine with those three people, you're, you're increasing by, um, uh, 75% uh, of an FTE, and we think, going back to sort of the economic challenges, we think we can do this, we've found a way to do this extremely economically. Um, so the industry's pretty excited about it. We're looking for other people who would be excited by this solution as well. Uh, next, please. So please feel free to contact me with if you have any questions or if you're interested in some of these solutions. Thanks. Great, thank you very much, Charlie. Uh, moving along, next up is Evergreens. Uh, Ahmad uh, Zamili, will, uh, who's the CEO and founder, uh, will be talking about their products. So let's see if we can get that one up. There we go, Ahmad, great to see you. Hi. All right, take thank it away. You, so I'm Ahmad Zamili, I'm the founder and CEO of Evergreens. We are a seed stage ag tech company bridging the gap between farm and fork. Next slide, please. We've developed a farming platform that allows us to grow food virtually anywhere in the world, uh, closer to where consumers are eating it, uh, regardless of any external or weather environments. Uh, this is commonly known as vertical farming if you guys are familiar with it. But our technology allows us to scale much more effectively and efficiently than other technologies that exist today, uh, which gives us access to wholesale markets and the ability to sell through them while maintaining a very healthy margin. Now, a couple of key points about our technology that allow us to be very capital and operationally efficient. Uh, the first is the way we irrigate our crops. Uh, it allows us to speed up the growth cycle of the plants significantly and to grow the plants a lot closer to one another. Our farms are fully automated from seed to harvest. The plants are autonomously monitored and the production flow is also autonomously managed by the farm itself. And our fields or the, uh, the, the beds of growth are modularized, meaning we have a very high flexibility um, of product mix and crop mix that we can grow. Uh, and those fields are isolated from one another, which allow us to prevent any cross-contamination between the plants and uh, sterilize the equipment after every cycle. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So what you're about to see is, that's it. What you're about to see is a rendering of what one of our farms actually looks like. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this is actually a farm that is currently under construction in Massachusetts. Uh, just for scale references, that conveyor belt is about uh, waist high. All of the operations that you see on the screen, which go from seeding, harvesting, environmental maintenance, those are all autonomous and automated. Um, the, uh, the little boxes that you see 
uh, around there are the fields that I mentioned before. That's where the, the beds of plants are. And the farm manages their placement and their movement within the farm and within those towers that you see. Um, and that's basically optimized to um, make packing as efficient as possible and lower the uh, switchovers when it comes to packaging. Now, throughout the plant's life cycle, we're constantly monitoring it autonomously and making adjustments to optimize the environment. And from all of that data that we collect, we're actually able to very accurately predict yields uh, of the plant at harvest, which is very useful when it comes to sales. Um, all of this automation allow us to cut down labor significantly in this process and allow us to scale a lot quicker uh, and add more of those tower modules that you see on the screen. Next slide, please. So this is how our technology kind of stacks up compared to the other vertical farms that exist on the market today. Uh, because of uh, the way we irrigate and the speed at which we grow our crops, we're able to harvest more times per year than other, crop, than other vertical farms. And because of the modularization and isolation of those fields, um, and because we clean them after every cycle, we don't need to shut down the farms as often to get it clean. So it's running pretty much all year round. Now, from a revenue and a cost perspective, uh, we can generate six times the amount of product per floor square foot um, using nine times less power, which is one of the largest uh, cost of goods when it comes to vertical farming. Um, and we can do all of this with half the number of people uh, working inside of the farm. Next slide, please. So the way we're commercializing this is we're first owning, building, owning, and operating our own farms um, and serving the New England region um, with starting with salad greens and then uh, slowly graduating and diversifying out of that crop category. Uh, our next one up that we're working on is uh, strawberries and then hopefully we'll move into uh, herbs. To scale geographically, both nationally and internationally, we're planning on franchising the model, the technology, and the brand, um, as well as the operational know-how that we've developed. Um, the, some of the names that you see on the right of the screen are uh, the first adopters of our consumer packaged good product, the leafy green product, that's about to hit markets later this year, uh, once that farm is, uh, the, the construction of that farm is complete. Next slide, I think that's over, but I have my contact details on there. If any of you have questions or want to reach out, please feel free to add me on LinkedIn or just email me. I'd love to chat. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And, and we get spoiled here um, at uh, because we get to taste Evergreen's products every so often. In fact, they did a test of some of their new packaging. Um, and so we brought, I brought uh, four packages of different flavors unbelievable i'm i i sing their praises the food was uh, i mean the, the leafy greens were fantastic so uh thank ahmed thank you uh, for presenting appreciate you you guys being here uh next thank up you. is boundless uh carl plum is the uh palm sorry is the founder and ceo carl you're up next excellent can you hear me tom i can yep perfect all right next slide i guess Excellent, so I'm Carl Palme. I'm the founder and CEO of Boundless Robotics, where we're using hydroponics, robotics, and artificial intelligence to, cult to cultivate health and happiness. Next slide. So as we know, the, the, the problem today is the majority of the food cost Carl, we lost your audio there, or at least I did. There we go. Did the slight change? Yeah, now, now it's good. All right, sorry about that. Next slide. All right, there we go. 
So we're, what we want to do is we want to build the largest decentralized farm system in the world. We believe that with today's technology, like, for example, robotics, artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, we can enable anyone anywhere to grow anything any time of the year. And with that, we can create a new marketplace platform for urban growers. So you can think about the gig economy plus urban farming, and we can create something like Uber Farms. Uh, but in order to do this, to, to really get this vision going, we have to start somewhere. And we have to start with something that has a huge impact uh, and that will allow us to grow as a company. Next slide. So the way we want to go about this is we obviously want to work with uh, focus on city dwellers because 67% of the US population lives in cities. We want to focus on a single crop so that we can really build this, this data set that we need for the artificial intelligence and so that we can really understand how people in different environments, different parts of the country, uh, and how the different water composition is affecting all of this growth in a plant. We want to focus on, a, and, and this crop obviously has to be something that is consumed by a lot of Americans. The crop that we've chosen is consumed by 12% of Americans on a daily basis. It is also something that is incredibly expensive, so we can justify the cost of the device. Uh, for example, this particular crop is, it costs $300 an ounce, and it's a plant whose sales increased 67% in 2020 in a market that is worth $67 billion. So if you haven't figured out what I'm talking about, uh, let's do the big reveal on the next slide. We got to start with cannabis. That's what's going to fund our future for food. Um, so let's go on to the next slide. Let me introduce to you the Anaboto. It is our AI enabled set it and forget it device for growing cannabis automatically. With it, we are seeing the ability to grow two ounces of high quality pesticide free cannabis at home. We have this artificial intelligence chef that takes all the input from your environment, your water, what plant you're growing, and it creates custom recipes so that you can always succeed while also lowering the cost of the device. We have a mobile app that educates our users, that acts as a main user interface between the device and, and the user. And the idea here is that users should only have to relax and change the water weekly, much like a humidifier, so it, it's familiar to them, all for $599, which means that with cannabis, the user can get a return on investment in as soon as the first grow. And what's really nice about cannabis is we can get up to four harvest cycles per year. So users can grow four plants at cannabis and, and, and harvest them uh, four times a year. And really the return on investment is very, very quick, which is exactly what we wanna go after so that we can create the supply chain and then lower the cost of the devices for other types of food crops. Next slide. The way this works is the device essentially is an internet of things enabled device, right? It has a lot of sensors. It's taking input from the environment, from the user, uh, and, and we're using deep water culture hydroponics because it allows us to grow the plant as fast as possible. There is a light system that also manages the odor but it includes a vision system that helps us understand how well the plant is growing, how receptive it's been to the nutrients that we're giving it. And the idea here is that we collect information every 15 minutes, we send it to the AI engine or the chef. Uh, it collects information from all the other devices that are out there. And on a weekly basis, it creates this custom recipe for your specific plant in its specific time of life and, and with your water composition and everything else that's going on in your environment. What's really nice about this architecture is that it gives us, uh, it's very modular. It, it gives us unconstrained scalability and applicability, which means that whether you're growing cannabis or arugula, we can adapt. And I've grown a lot of arugula on this device and it tastes wonderful. And the also, the, the, the great thing about this is with every single plant that we grow, uh, we collect more data and every single plant is gonna grow better and better. Next slide. The people we are addressing are Jessa, the chic stoner, Carrie, the canna mom, Trent, the plant daddy, these are people who are actively uh, using cannabis, but, but the wonderful thing about this audience is they're also the same people who are interested in growing their own food, who are interested in consuming products that are pesticide free, and who also have the incomes to really buy these automated farms at home and get us ready so that we can, again, lower the cost and, and make this accessible to most people in, in the US and eventually the world. Next slide. So we have these devices, we have 10 devices deployed in the field. We're planning on, on making another 300 devices this year and, and deploy them across Massachusetts so that we can control some of the variables. And I'm happy to share more of this information with anybody who's interested. So let's grow together. And that's it. Thank you, Carl. Appreciate that. Uh, great. And that's uh, that was really different from from what we've seen before. But but obviously, as you mentioned, applicable as you grow to to expand to other crops. And, and that's going to be exciting. So thank you yeah, very much. It's unconventional, but it's we're solving the problem. <laughs> exactly. All right. Next up is Ubrios and Anders will uh, one of the founders of Ubrios is talk about their soft gripping.
Andre, uh, how are you? Thanks, Tom. Um, yep, that is Uber Ross. Uh, and, oh, sorry. Uh, yep, no worries. <laughs> uh, I'm the founder of Uber Ross. Hello, everyone. I wanted to give you a quick pitch about what our technology and why we are here today. Um, we uh, make the most versatile hand on earth, obviously the robotic uh, hand, uh, to say. So why did we go into this? And I'm, I'm really pleased to see all other presenters over here. And there is a whole ecosystem of, um, of solutions that goes from the farm to the table. And we are fitting a bit end of, uh, like later end of that cycle where things get out of the farm and get into the hands of, of people. Um, so we are trying to get, you know, reduce the number of hands that touch your food. Uh, next slide. So picking and packing is uh, obviously done uh, by human workers today, and there are reasons for it, and all the presenters of today and customers know this. It's expensive. We don't have uh, that many people to actually handle the, the demand and meet the demand, and people are uninterested in doing this because uh, there, there, there isn't much uh, growth opportunities in terms of career, uh, very mundane tasks. So these are robot jobs uh, and uh, humans are not supposed to be doing this type of uh, uh, tasks anyway. So that's where we fit in. Um, in the next slide, we have a solution proposal for that. And um, Iberos Gripper, Gentle, uh, actually reduces the cost of delicate item packaging to a fraction of the alternative solutions mainly human and other other robotic solutions um, and how do we do this we have uh, developed uh, a gripper with rubber fingers so that has the gentleness of a human hand um, it is significantly more affordable than other solutions out there including human hand it is fully electrically actuated that means you could put this solution on any conveyor system uh, even your drones uh, that I think one of the, the uh, participants also presented, you can put these solutions on drones um, and it's very lightweight, uh, so it is easily deployable. And I'll give you a little more information about this in, in the next slide. Next slide, please. All right. Um, first of all, though, we want to understand whether or not, and I'm talking to Jeff, Dale, and Marty mostly over here, and maybe Charles and Ahmad, to see if soft gripper is something that you need. And I am here to help you with that decision first. Um, soft grippers may not be the solution that you need in your business. And there are multiple dimensions to actually identify this. And like I said before, I will be happy to have the conversation with you, sit down and see what your challenge is uh, and propose a solution for that. Um, object variation can be a, a, a parameter, precision, weight, fragility of the object, surface finish. So if you have an object that is, you know, highly variable, let's say tomatoes, they are not the same, uh, or, um, or maybe uh, chicken breasts, right? They are not always the same size. Or you don't need a lot of precision, so you, low precision, uh, maybe not a ton of payload requirement. Or, or you might have, I don't know, very fragile objects like lettuces, Romano lettuces. So um, you might need a soft gripper, but if that is not the case, perhaps a suction cup will work for you or a rigid, rigid gripper. However, when you realize soft grippers are needed for your solution or uh, for, for your challenge, Uberos may not be the only gripper for you. And I'll be again here for you to talk about what solutions you have uh, in front of you or uh, options you have and then discuss what we can offer. And in the next slide, I'm going to touch upon how Uberos grippers, gentle gripper, is um, different than others. So when you think about soft gripper as a solution, you have really not many options. You have uh, two other competitors other than Uberos. And um, when it comes to cost, uh, when I say cost, it's a monetary spend to obtain the tool, so it's directly related to ROI. Uh, we have a significant edge. So if you click on, as I speak, if you click on the animations, Joyce, that'd be, that'd be great so that uh, we can see the comparison on each dimension. So the Euros Gentle Grippers are going to be a lot more affordable. In terms of gentleness, we are uh, going to provide you with as gentle of a gripper as the others. However, when it comes to simplicity, because uh, ease of setup and adjustment with electrical grippers, I think uh, on-robot solution and our solution are head-to-head. 
Um, when it comes to speed, again, this is highly related to ROI, that is line speed. Uh, we are up there with soft robotics, which is a pneumatic solution. Um, when it comes to adaptability, uh, they, that means ability to conform a large variety of objects that you might have in your line. Um, very, very adaptive solution in our uh, portfolio. In terms of ability to deploy systems and ease of installation, you might need a, a plug and play system that actually gets operational within minutes of opening the box. And we provide you with that solution uh, in Eberos, uh, with Eberos Gentle Grippers. Again, I invite you to, on the next slide, I uh, invite all of the participants, uh, Jeff, Dale, Marty, thank you very much for your presentations today. All the challenges that you put out there are really intriguing for me, and I would like to have the conversation with you. And I would like to also invite Charles and Ahmad because of their uh, you know, solutions up, up here. I think we can come up with really, really smart solutions to address some of the pain points in the, in the food chain. So thank you very much for the time today, Tom. And uh, Joyce, I appreciate the invite. I uh, always love to have you. Thank you, Anders. Um, next up is uh, Fringe AI. Chris. Chris Hayden um, is the co-founder of Fringe AI. Um, Fringe AI was recently acquired by LMI, um, and so they are also now listed as LMI, LM, LMI AI Solutions. So, Chris, you're up. Mm. I do not see Chris. Let's see if we're having a challenge. Okay. One of the wonderful things about doing all of these virtual meetings is you have these occasionally uh, challenges, both on technical, as we had with a couple of presenters uh, ago, and then also uh, I think we're missing Chris. So we might skip. I'm going to look for Joyce, who runs us the back end. We'll go to next Terra. Um, and uh, Lana Graf is the CEO of, of Nextera, and uh, Lana, if you're available, we'll, we'll go with Lana. Uh-oh, I'm 0 for 2 here. No, no, I think we're good. I was just like okay. trying to turn on, you know, like my video. I actually, to be honest, will be uh, really brief, uh, you okay. know, so we do uh, robotic solutions for, um, you know, like any type of, um, industries if we can you know like have a next slide so the um, key point for us is that we are basically operational system for any robotics or automation and uh, we're using um, a lot of libraries that are uh, available for different uh, areas of automation next slide please and uh, among our clients are just like usually uh, like a car manufacturers or if possible next slide please there we go okay cool so yeah so among our clients are like a really big brands and uh, it's kind of no surprise in a way that we can make work together simultaneously as a single task you know like any type of automation and robotic solutions so speaking of we are like literally hardware agnostic company uh, at this point we are mostly focusing on construction but we have a lot of clients in food industry and we are super proud with the dunkin donut clients uh, dunkin bronze um, i'll be explaining the case a bit later uh, can we have a next slide please so uh, and the next one yeah so this is usually how we mimic the uh, uh, kind of real manpower um, uh, solutions for uh, food industry the good stuff is uh, we are as i said absolutely hardware agnostic and we are working with european chinese uh, japanese you know like type of uh, uh, machines and uh, the most important um, kind of uh, part here is all the machinery working in one single listing. So this is the key part. So whatever client might be interested or needed, we just kind of mimicking that with the uh, robotic automation, putting like literally not single steps, but tasks. Um, can we have a few more next slides? So it's just like our showcase in the food industry. 
so this is more like I cannot say like as a pitch it's just you know like whatever possible with the uh, robotic automation like literally to eliminate repeating and uh, heavy tasks and um, uh, can we have next slide yeah and uh, recently we were um, you know like advertising the idea of um, kind of an external workforce where you are like literally not buying a solution you are not investing much but you are paying um, for an invoice you know like uh, blue color workforce or whatever we might uh, name it uh, literally by the hour and uh, Nextera workforce was like very well um, kind of adopted uh, with our clients when you only have to pay like uh, hourly wage for those, you know, uh, robotics. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is a short video. So just like it's interesting to uh, kind of see this uh, automation development for um, for dunking brands like the video we can share, you know, for marketing purposes. Uh, we started from just, you know, one robot and then we expanded to multiple amount of factories and uh, it was so well um, uh, kind of received at the factory because literally they, they there were like two buttons uh, that they were um, operating with like start and stop uh, and uh, we figured this uh, again with our software doesn't really matter what type of application it might be like anything so whoever you know like in production lines has anything to automate it might be not only of course like basket lining or help with drizzling uh, it's also you know um kind of an interesting part for um you know even fleet management at the very house so this is um kind of um, interesting findings for us as well that it's a huge industry for back office automation that is like not really covered by um like much robotics automation because it's required a lot of programming becoming like a burdensome in terms of money but with the idea that you have uh, prescribed written libraries and then uh that you are able to charge like bill by the hour this is kind of the key thing to make probably automation happen uh next slide please Yeah, so we can go next uh, and also next. So this is quite self-explanatory where it is important. Yeah, solutions are usually super simple. We like literally trying to replicate what, uh, you know, uh, manpower does in, uh, in, in all type of settings. Uh, again, like crucial parts, usually how to maintain the fleet, how to operate. So it should not be super hard. That's why everything is connected to Wi-Fi fleet. Uh, to the cloud and we can see everything that's happening, you know, like on the factory on the floor and we can, you know, like remove some obstacles uh, remotely. So far, it's been just amazing. Next uh, slide, please. And again, next. This is just a showcase. Yeah, this is just the real thing. And next. 
yeah, going forward. So there are multiple solutions uh, that are available uh, for automation. Now we are working on uh, this, you know, kind of literally donut preparation. Every single donut needs to be weighted. And uh, it's quite the kind of significant cost, like four or three people working on here on the conveyor. Uh, we will be, you know, like working with uh, a, a Uber robots or UR robots and some Omega robots on that. So uh, that's quite soon will be a live video. So can we go next? And next, this is our process on fleet management. That was very cool. We are using, you know, like Amazon type of cards for fleet management, you know, like for loading and loading uh, the cages for any type of factories. Uh, the software is already kind of written, we're just reusing our libraries and the focus of ours is usually navigation on the warehouse. So we're using, you know, like deep video, LiDAR uh, systems that again were, you know, like used in different industries. Basically this module we get from car manufacturing floors. So it's like a complete reuse of libraries. Uh, again, the core part is the software that running on top of any type of hardware. Can we go next? Next. So yeah, of course it all gets to the uh, kind of factory uh, ERP type of thing. So all the efficiencies, uh, unit economics might be upgraded, uh, but uh, it's uh, rather obvious like multiple players right now doing so. The only difference uh, is we are using our own sensors. Um, can we go next? Yeah, so, and this is just, you know, like our partnership, basically the wrapping up slide, uh, any type of machinery might be used, depends on budget, but now with the uh, model, business model of Nextera workforce, where we're literally billing uh, by the hour, same and sometimes even cheaper as the, you know, like a, a normal bill for an employee, um, this is probably even less relevant. So if any questions or inquiries, just like super happy to chat always. Thank you. Lana, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And I, and I love the concept of the, you know, the workforce, essentially the robots by the hour. Um, and, uh, and I know that changes the business model for so many companies. Um, and it does uh, change also the model for the, for the startups or, or the uh, hardware providers. Uh, so next up, uh, I'm going to go back to Chris. He's our last speaker. So Chris from Fringe AI. Thanks to the uh, the invite and the time to present to everybody here. Uh, basically, my name is Chris Aiden. I'm one of the co-founders of Fringe AI. I was the CEO until we were acquired in January. And briefly, we started Fringe AI uh, with an old idea. And uh, Theodore Levitt in 1969 once stated that people don't want to buy a quarter inch drill, they want a quarter inch hole. And so, Basically, uh, myself, my co-founders saw the emergence of AI technology, IoT technology, and, and I would say new business models based on providing services. And um, we decided we were going to launch the company around uh, uh, trying to, to provide a turnkey solution for AI-based inspections. And that's what we did in 2019. Again, we were acquired in 2021. And at the end of the day, our value proposition to our customers is that we want to um, maximize yield and reduce the uh, expenses. And, and I'll, let me show a quick demo and then I'll, I'll actually a couple demos and I'll talk about uh, what we did as a company to be successful. So what you're showing right now is a uh, application at a leading meat producer uh, where um, we are grading the uh, um, the middle section of a hog uh, just before it is fed into a, a loin pole device that uh, separates the belly from the loin. So in this case, those are two very, very uh, expensive cuts of meat. So it's, uh, it's uh, to be able to optimize the, uh, the cut between the two really maximizes the yield. And in the middle, you're seeing what we call our gadget app which is just showing what the AI models are doing. It's showing some of the data that's being communicated to the cloud for both diagnostics and performance. Um, and that was part of, of what we did because one of the things that's interesting, and I think a lot of the uh, presenters here would agree is, is um, there's a lot of different applications right now that are driving um, new innovation in AI and IoT technology. 
And it's, it's easy to pick up and learn some of the basics. What's not so easy is to deploy one of these solutions in a production environment. So our focus from day one was how do we get these systems into a production environment where we're actually solving real problems. And in this case, um, you know, these systems have been running for almost a year. Um, I know our customers benefited both from uh, reduction in operating expense and also uh, a huge improvement in yield. Um, so next slide. So one of the things we also discovered early on is that, uh, I mean, these, these AI-based inspections, they, they're not as simple to maintain and support as a, a conventional rules-based vision system. Uh, for a conventional rules-based vision system, when the measurement starts to go sideways, usually something in the system is drifted, and you, you pull up your golden reference part, you look at the, uh, the features you might have used for fixturing and for extracting different features, uh, some of the tools doing measurements, and you, you tweak those. Well, I mean, AI is a, is a data-centric uh, approach to solving problems. And so that means that in order to support these systems, you have to have a system that is inherently built to um, monitor data, to archive data that's important. Um, in our case, we need the ability to get onto the systems, to add new data to the training data set, retrain. Uh, and this is what I'm showing here, which is one of our dashboards. And what I'm showing here is, yes, it's showing some of the performance data, but it's also showing some of the opportunities once you, you start to deploy one of these systems to see information and data you never would have seen before. And in, in this case, this is data from that system I just showed, and we're actually seeing uh, what we're calling is model misses. And in fact, what that is, is sometimes these uh, pork sides uh, get, get fed into the loin pole machine backwards. Uh, well, there is an orientation. It does matter. So it, that does two things. One, the yield for that sample that just got cut uh, is, is a mess. I mean, it, it's, it gets mutilated. It does get fed back through, but it's, you've sacrificed at least one half of, of, the, uh, of the product. The other thing that does is that cause is a, a lot of wear and tear on the cutting mechanism in the loin pole device. So just by monitoring this, these inspections to see how are things working, we're actually starting to see an opportunity to improve the automation further, um, reduce the operating expense of maintaining these machines, and again, improve the yield by preventing uh, these types of, of uh, issues from happening by, say, for example, stopping the line, enabling a team member to get down there and flip the loins, or even if there was another level of automation, perhaps automating that. So this is a big part of our solution. Next. So this is a, a, a different application, same factory, and in which case what we're doing is we're sorting the left side and right side loins right upstream of this. The, uh, there's a blade that's separating the shoulder from the left and right side. And then there's two, con there's two conveyors uh, moving in the same direction. And then there's the actuator that's separating left and right. So again, the, um, the, the solution we provided, it's a turnkey solution. We don't ask the customer to do any labeling, to do any data collection, archiving. We provide the solution and we're there to support it if the system needs, needs support. In this case, you might think this is a, a trivial application, but actually for a, a computer vision system using rules-based vision to uh, accurately identify left and right size, very challenging. Uh, for AI, it's something that's, that's very uh, tractable and in this case, uh, we're able to do it. And, and, you know, keep in mind, a lot of these systems, again, we're leveraging technology that's, that's moving very quickly. Uh, a lot of the technology, for example, the edge processors, uh, the modeling, it's being driven by things like self-driving cars. So we are very much uh, taking mature technology and applying it to solve some of these, these food processing applications. Next. So here's just another couple of examples before I go into a solution overview. Uh, so I thought it would be interesting to show not just the, uh, the upstream uh, processing of the meat, but also downstream. In this case, we're, we're looking at sausages and we're looking for defects. In this case, we have five different defects or five different things we're trying to classify. We're looking for good sausage. We're looking for uh, conjoined sausage. We're looking for misforms. Uh, we're looking for underfill. And we're looking for areas where the uh, filling has either burst out of the uh, out of the liner, or there's no liner at all. 
And I can tell you from, from this example, I think we uh, our training data set was was less than a couple hundred images, and the uh, our level of false positives and false negatives is below one percent. Um, and this was this was a problem that was right now uh, has team members that uh, whose job it is to uh, to spot these defects and clear it from the line. Uh, we're in the process of with one of our partners uh, designing and, and deploying a full automation system for this application. Next. So this is another video. Um, we don't just look at the uh, the main product uh, and this, uh, that was the meat. We also look at the packaging. And what we're showing here is our is a model pipeline. We don't uh, we don't when we talk to our customers, we're not trying to sell tools and and uh, concepts and and uh, uh, software that our our customer has to staff up and learn to use. We provide the full solution. We look at the inspection. Uh, we talk to the customer, what do they need? In this case, the customer needed to be able to detect defects. They needed to archive these defects for traceability. Uh, but, but the challenge here was sometimes we'd know what the defect was, sometimes we wouldn't. So in this case, we're using an object detector and an autoencoder so that we can detect both the, the known defects, we're calling specific defects, and the, um, the gross defects, which we could classify later and add to the uh, um add to the inspection at a later time and so uh this again is, is an application that is uh we're working with uh, very closely with the end customer uh, and in this case we're actually talking to some uh uh sensors that that are not lmi sensors so we're very agnostic to the types of sensors that we can communicate to and it's important for us to be able to tie into the existing automation and sensor tech that's on the line next so what do we provide? In this case, uh, the diagram shows five of these silos. The automation systems either exist or get developed by a partner. Vision systems, again, uh, a lot of these are out there, whether it's area scan cameras or, or 3D cameras generating point clouds. We work with all of them, uh, provided there's, there's an API and most, most support some sort of an SDK or API. What we actually sell for our services are uh, from left to right is the modeling services. So again, we don't charge our customer for the tools for them to staff up, to learn how to use, to extract the model. We sell the complete model. Customer owns the model. Uh, we'll help the customer come up to speed on how to, how to support the model if that's what they choose to do later on. But we can certainly get, get uh, companies very quickly up and running using AI tech. And again, um, uh, we solve the full inspection. We're not looking to, to sell tools, just like, uh, Theodore Levitt said, we're not selling you the drill, we're selling you the hole. Um, the, the middle part, the inspection gadget, that was something we learned uh, almost immediately that there's, there's not, uh, there, there's a, an opportunity for us to innovate and that was to develop the, uh, the software platform that would communicate to the sensors, uh, be able to run the, the AI inference, communicate information, diagnostics up to the cloud, and then pass results onto the automation system. And then, What's part of that then is the cloud services and, and fortunate for us, again, there's a bunch of companies like, like Google Cloud Platform, like AWS, Azure, that, that have these services, uh, perhaps different applications, slightly different applications, but we can use the IoT backend uh, for getting data on and off our, uh, the, the inspection. Uh, it's all secure, authenticated uh, channels, so it's, it's, there's, there's no risk of, of um, getting uh how would you say hijacked at the inspection and and so uh, and again this this technology is being pushed by a bunch of different industries and we're able to leverage that and apply it to uh, our customers needs next so again we were just uh, uh we're, we're looking for for strategic customers we were just acquired in january which means we've got uh, a bunch of, of resources at our disposal both in terms of technical support uh, we're bringing our own hardware platforms online that's going to so we can actually provide a a full solution including the hardware at least for the uh, the edge processor and the uh, the sensors and uh again looking forward to uh to working with uh with some of you guys and solve some of your tough inspection applications great thank you very much chris appreciate that so uh folks that that uh, ends our uh our kind of foray into technology around food. Um, we are really excited to be able to offer this, uh, this event. We, as I said at the beginning, we offer similar events in different verticals 
like defense, construction, manufacturing, logistics. Um, and uh, please uh, let us know if you're interested in another type of area or vertical. We're, we're excited to bring robotics um, and the uh, different developments that are out there to, uh, to you. And we're happy to do more of that. Um, we couldn't do any of this without our sponsors, so I want to thank all of them who contribute uh, to our uh, mission and allowing us to do the, the work we do. Thank you all. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all at another event coming up soon. Thanks.